Mark, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Franklin, which of these am I using? Which microphone am I using? Okay, well, you figure it out. I'll figure it out. All right. So we return to Mark this morning with something of a jolt. For almost all of March... April and May, the Sunday Gospel readings have come from the serene, confident perspective of John. And today, we tumble headlong back into the wild, tense, fast-paced drama of Mark, who gives his readers absolutely no rest from the turmoil surrounding Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry. No rest. Did you get that? A little ironic, since we find ourselves right in the middle of a controversy over keeping Sabbath, the day of rest. It can be hard for us to remember that we're eavesdropping on an intra-Jewish debate. Jesus is not a Christian outsider dissing Jewish ritual. Jesus, the Jew, observed the Sabbath by participating in rituals like Shabbat dinners and synagogue services. What Jesus debated with other Jewish rabbis was the practical relationship between Sabbath and the messiness of human existence that continues on the Sabbath day. There wasn't anything particularly unusual about this debate. How stringently to keep the Sabbath had been argued over among Jews for hundreds of years before Jesus, for hundreds of years after Jesus, it is still argued over among Jews to this very day. What is the meaning of work? on this day. We shouldn't be surprised either by the reaction of of a certain strict faction, 
the Pharisees, among Jews, to the behavior of Jesus' disciples, and to Jesus' own behavior in healing a man during the Sabbath service. Both actions, the plucking of grain on the Sabbath, the day of rest, and the work of healing on the day of rest, would have provoked the Pharisees. But, importantly, not necessarily other Jews, perhaps even most other Jews at the time. You know, the clever phrase that Jesus gives us, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath, is echoed among other rabbis during the same time. I doubt highly that, that this phrase would have offended most people. What is unusual in today's reading is the stunning claim of authority Jesus makes. So therefore, the, Lord, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's a packed claim, and we'll come back to just one sliver of it later on. But for now, just let the little, the little word Lord stay with you. So it should be clear that Jesus never does this, the keeping of Sabbath. He never told his followers that the Ten Commandments were now options for us to keep or to forget about. Although Jesus' believers gradually transferred Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday to honor the day of Jesus' resurrection, and they did so pretty early on, most Jews and Christians still share a basic framework for how we keep the day, what we do on this day. We set aside normal routines and work activities. We gather for prayer and reflection on God's word. We share a meal. Sometimes I think that the folks most in need of a renewed sense of what it means to keep the Sabbath are Christians who go to church mostly every Sunday. Let me unpack that as an individual Christian. So on Friday, this Christian showed up here to remember Judy Evans along with all of you and to give thanks for Judy. And after that powerful experience we shared, I drove back home and got myself ready. I studied synod assembly reports for the rest of the day and then participated in a four-hour dinner meeting discussing candidates for the bishop. Yesterday, <laughs> was my first full day that I really had a bunch of time to invest in sermon preparation. So I was at it all day. Today, after worship, having gotten up early, I drive back to Faith Lutheran Church in Cambridge, where I will participate in a four-hour leadership retreat to discuss the status of our plans for building and fundraising. Then, tomorrow, at 9 o'clock, I have a fundraising team meeting on Zoom, after which I will spend a bunch of time emailing various fundraisers that we're in touch with. On Wednesday, I drive to Worcester, and I will spend Wednesday through Saturday there for the, the Synod Assembly, which are longer days than I'm used to now. You know, it's really easy for a Christian like me, who comes to church, who does all of these things, most of them pretty churchy things. It's pretty easy for me to pat myself on the back for that. I'm a good Christian. 
because I'm doing all of this. This is the Lord's work that I'm doing, reading synod assembly reports, talking to fundraisers, getting ready for synod assembly, participating in it, etc. That's all the Lord's work, right? Sort of. But the Lord's work is what you, Christian, do when you finally get out of bed and get into the day in life with your neighbor, in a community in which some are rejoicing because of good things that have happened in their lives, in a community in which some people are broken, absolutely broken by what they are themselves experiencing, your neighbors and your call in order to be a good Christian is to be a little Christ among those people. We proclaim Christ Jesus. We also proclaim ourselves as slaves, slaves of the needs of others for his sake. It seems to me, sisters and brothers, that part of the need for renewal of Sabbath goes much deeper into the awareness of how constantly tempted we are to justify our own lives and our own worth before God through all kinds of activities, and the most insidious of those activities are usually churchy type activities. We need a renewed sense of the freedom we are given in the gift of Torah. In today's first reading, we hear a portion of Moses' final sermon to the people of Israel as they stand on the edge of promise. He preaches on the Ten Commandments, the ten words spoken by God at Sinai and we hear this bit about the command to keep Sabbath. Keep Sabbath, Moses says, and we will, we will remember God's work of love and re redemption. We will ensure that those who work like slaves in our society can actually enjoy a day of rest. See, Sabbath is a gift of God as much as it is a command. God gives us this gift to help us stop idolizing our work by focusing on God's work and giving thanks. The Sabbath helps us fight against our inclinations to justify ourselves by our jobs or our church activities or anything else. The command to make sure everyone has space for Sabbath in their lives is a primary impetus to social justice. There really is a difference between experiencing a day off and experiencing a day off sanctified to the Lord. <clears throat> there was a guy named Abraham Joshua Heschel. Say that fast, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was a Jewish theologian who lived, and rabbi, who lived in the 20th century, he was great. He was great. He was a profound thinker and taught at Jewish Theological Seminary in New York for a whole bunch of years and actually was one of the principal Jew, American Jews standing with Martin Luther King Jr. throughout the civil rights movement. They're a really impressive person. He wrote some great books. The Prophets is a book I recommend anyone who is interested in the, the religious underpinnings of social justice. But I want to mention the splendid little book that he wrote called Sabbath, Its Meaning for Modern Man. So it's written in 1951, I think. So it's still modern man. But the Sabbath, Its Meaning for Modern Man, it's a great little book. And in that book, uh, Heschel suggests that the person who observes the Sabbath day throughout a lifetime has already spent one-seventh of her life in paradise. I love that. 
And then he recounts a rabbinic story in which the Sabbath is personified as a woman. When Adam saw the majesty of the Sabbath, her greatness and her beauty, the joy she conferred upon all beings, he intoned a song of praise for the Sabbath day as if to give thanks to her. Then God said to him, You sing a song of praise to the Sabbath day, and you sing none to me, the God of the Sabbath. Thereupon, the Sabbath rose from her seat, prostrated herself before God, singing, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And the whole creation added, and to sing praise unto thy name, O Most High. Heschel concludes, the Sabbath teaches all beings whom to praise. Ah, and there is the beginning of what it means for us that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. This one who teaches us to praise, the one who really deserves our praise. We meet the God of the Sabbath in the person of Jesus, the one who still comes among us in worship to heal withered lives and broken hearts. Good Sabbath to you all. In Christ's name, amen.